God bless you. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Listen, we believe that it was the divine hand of God that led you here right now. We know that there's a word for you. This is all we need you to do. Open your ears, open your mind, and let God into your heart and see what the word is today. Come on, let's go into sanctuary. Amen. You know we're continuing in our season of greater than. And I hope you're still joining me at 12 noon every day, reciting John chapter 14, verse 12, which simply says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. I want you to understand. When we say that we're in a season of greater than, that season of greater than may not look great to other people. The reason for that is greater for the believer sometimes is different than greater for the world. Today, I just want to talk to you for a little while from the topic, work on your serve. Work on your serve. One of my favorite, one of my favorite sports, honestly, is tennis. As I've gotten up now, y'all know I always say a lot of things are my favorite sports. I really, really just like sports. I like golf. I like basketball. I like football. I love baseball. I love all this. I love tennis. I love tennis. Y'all know the Williams sisters. They got a new movie coming out. It's called King Richard. It's about their growing up with their father, Richard Williams, and how he trained them to be great tennis players. And this is the interesting thing about the Williams sisters. Both of the Williams sisters, if you watch them play tennis, they have a dominant serve. They throw that ball up in the air, give it a whack, and hit it across. And the serve is the most one of the most powerful shots in the game. It's so powerful that they actually use speed cameras to find out how fast and how hard somebody's serve is. Serena Williams, for instance, averages a serve of 106 miles per hour. That's on average, which means that there are times that she's clocking up at 110, 112, because when she hits that ball and it goes flying across, here's the thing, I feel sorry for folk on the other side of it, because that ball is going to hit and you may never see it to be able to return it. And it's because of her serve that she has been one of the most dominant tennis players for the last what, two, three decades now? There's no denying that Serena is the GOAT. And I believe it's because of her serve. But I want you to understand that we all have to work on our serves. As believers, as Christians, you've got to work on your serve. And the reason you've got to work on your serve is because the serve is powerful, the serve is dominant, and the serve gives you the ability to win and become great. But I'm not talking about a tennis serve. I'm talking about our service to humanity. I'm talking about our service to God. I'm talking about how we serve others and the things that we do for God and the things that we do in God. Because when we're believers, when we're following Christ, We've got to work on our serve. Look at what the Bible tells us. Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 through 28 read as follows. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked the favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at the left in your kingdom. Jesus responds, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the other 10 disciples heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. But just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus is saying greatness comes from serving. That's why you have to work 
on your serve. But can I be honest with you? It's things like this that make Jesus so confusing to non-believers. It's things like this that makes Christians so confusing to non-believers. When you're really living a Christian life, when you're really living a life that follows God, that follows the word of God, that shows that you're a disciple of Jesus, that shows you living and walking in his footsteps, you will be misunderstood. The best way to know that you're doing well as a believer and that you're growing in discipleship is when folk that know you well start saying, you've changed. When folk that know you well start saying, I just don't understand you anymore. Because here's the thing, Christians have always been misunderstood. We've been misunderstood because we're supposed to live, move, think, believe, and value differently. As a matter of fact, the belief system of Christians is so unusual that it's been called the most dangerous religion in the world. 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche called Christianity the most dangerous of all religions. In his book, The Antichrist, Nietzsche asserts that Christianity's danger lies in the fact that it creates a transvaluation of values. According to Nietzsche, Christianity turns everything upside down by its belief structure. Nietzsche is essentially saying that the transvaluation of values is moving things that are supposed to be good to being bad and things that are supposed to be bad to being good or things that are supposed to be high to being low or th and things that are supposed to be low to being high. His argument is that it doesn't make sense and it's unnatural and he has a point. You know, every skeptic of Christianity does, is not without point. He has a point. He just misunderstands. From the very beginning, Jesus said this was different. Remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus gave the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, look at what he said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Look at what Jesus lays out in the Beatitudes. He goes through a list of blessings that don't seem like blessed people. Look what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Nobody's signing up to be poor let alone poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. To mourn, you have to lose something. Nobody's signing up for mourning. Blessed are the meek. Everybody wants to be seen. People want to be known. They don't want to be meek and control their power. Folk want to flaunt what they've got. Blessed are the merciful. You ever notice that plenty of people are not merciful? They like to rub it in and show folk who they are. As Jesus goes through all of these beatitudes, all these blessings, to Nietzsche, it sounds crazy because no one would sign up for that. But that's what makes the believer different. We believe something different, so we act differently. Notice Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. If you've ever been insulted, if you've ever been persecuted, if you've ever had folk talking mess behind your back, the last thing you felt was blessed. What you felt was anger. What you felt was like you wanted some revenge. What you felt was you wanted to go have a talking to somebody. But Jesus says, listen, don't go have a talking to them. You're blessed when that is going on. Because if you're doing that for me, you're falling in line with the prophets of old. You're falling in line with people who have been through this before, done this before, and lived through this before. And there will be a great blessing for you on the other side. I want you to know, my brother, I want you to know my sister. The the reason we work on our serve, the reason we live differently, the reason we believe differently is simply because as Christians, we are different. 
We do the opposite of what the world teaches. We're countercultural in so many ways. We just roll different. We act different. We believe different. When we become believers, we're supposed to become different. We're supposed to have different thoughts, different values, a different lifestyle. And here's the question I want to ask you for some of you who are watching that aren't believers. How's it working for you now? So many things in life that we've taken for granted as the way they are because they're natural as the way they're supposed to be, because it's just how I am. How's it working for you? Many of the things that we find natural don't bring us joy. Many of the things that we find natural don't bring us hope. Many of the things that we find natural keep us up at night, keep us wondering why is this going on? And this is what I want you to know. Jesus came to turn the world upside down and his believers, his disciples, those of us who have bought into the beliefs of Jesus Christ are supposed to be upside down. I do a handstand right now, but Lord knows I probably hurt myself. We're supposed to be upside down. We're supposed to have different thoughts, different values values, a different lifestyle. When your thoughts become different because you're lining up your thoughts with the thoughts of God. And God simply said in his word, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He's not saying that to believers. He's saying that to get believers to understand that believing in God, following Jesus requires a transformation. It requires that we reorder our lives, reorder our thoughts, reorder our values. It requires that we do the work to not be who we were, but who we should be and who we can become. And to be honest with you, what makes Christians great, if you're going to be greater than, if you're going to do better than, is your ability to serve. Your ability to roll up your sleeves and pitch in. Your ability is to roll up your sleeves and make the world a better place. The truth of the matter is, when we make the decision to roll up our sleeves, make the world a better place, and get involved, we have simply said, not that I'm going to accept things that I can't change, but there are certain things that I cannot accept, so I must work to change them. I want you to understand that when we're believers, when we are God's people walking the earth, there should be some things that we say, that is out of line, that is not of God, and I'm going to do something about it. About it. But too often, can I help you? We think greatness moves us away from service when greatness is supposed to move you towards service. Look at what Jesus is discussing with his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, verses 20 through 28. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to read 20 through 28. I'm just going to read 24 through 28. This is what I want you to see. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus calls them aside and tells them about this because of what happens beforehand. If you read the whole passage, starting in verse 20, what you find out is the sons of Zebedee, their mother comes by and she sees Jesus. She's like, Jesus, I need to ask you a favor. When you come into your kingdom, can you let one of my sons sit at your right hand and one of my sons sit at your left hand? In other words, she's saying, look, with, with all they've gone through, they done left home, they've been following you around for three years, with all they've given up, can you just do me a favor? Can you let them have a little power? Can you let them sit in a place of prominence? Can you let them be great for a little while? And Jesus says, I can't do that. Jesus tells her, look, th those seats are already set out by my father, God. But the question is, can you all drink the cup that I'm drinking? They say, yeah, I can. But here's the thing. You know what? Their mother had this conversation with Jesus in private. And James and John's had it in private. But here's the thing. Private conversations often become public, which is why the disciples got mad when they heard about it. The Bible says indignant. And Jesus calls them aside like, hold on, y'all. Y'all are missing the point. Brings them together and says... You know the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. What, she, what Jesus is trying to get them to understand is, this ain't going to be what you think. Have you ever signed up for something and it wasn't what you thought? 
Have you ever signed up for something where you, you thought it was going to be one way, but it was another way? What, what you signed up for, what you had in mind, what you had in vision, when you got there, you were like, this is not that at all. Jesus is trying to remind his disciples, this is not that at all. And here's the problem. These are the people who were closest to him. These are the people who he handpicked, who had been following him, who had seen miracles performed, who had done all this thing, all these things with proximity to Jesus, but they still hadn't gotten the point. Let me explain something to you. In your walk with God, proximity isn't everything. They had been around Jesus. They had been close to Jesus. They had been walking with Jesus from town to town. They had had, they had, had personal conversations, private conversations. They knew Jesus as well as anybody could know him, yet they still didn't get it. I want you to understand that too many times, even us as believers, we just don't get it. Knowing scripture and living scripture are not the same thing. Knowing Jesus and following Jesus are not the same thing. We've got to get from knowledge to application where we start following God, following his word, following his will, and following his way. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand this isn't what you think. This isn't about power. This isn't about proximity. This is about serving. This is about the life that you live. This is about the life that you lead. This is about you moving and doing what you need to do to really follow what I I'm calling you to. Oftentimes, we want positions, but we don't realize what's required. We want positions because we see people in them, and it looks like fun. It looks like something great. But what I want you to understand is proximity and position are not great. Because here's the thing, you often don't know what goes behind it. You know, th there's a lot of folk now who want to be entrepreneurs. You know, that, that's the new big thing. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur because they're like, that looks good. That looks like fun. Look at how much I would make more money if I was doing this on my own. I could be in charge. I could go on better vacation. You start seeing all of the rewards and you want proximity to that. But what most folk don't know about entrepreneurs is that it takes 10 years to get a business up. 80% of businesses fail. And many people who want to be entrepreneurs aren't even good employees. They can't show up on time for work. They don't want to do the work while they're there. This is what you got to understand. When you strike out on your own and you become an entrepreneur, it's not a bunch of Instagram moments of look at all my sales. It's not a bunch of Instagram moments of looking at how I'm elevating, manifesting, and moving up. When you're an entrepreneur, you're the first one in and the last one out. You have to care more than everybody else. You have to work harder than everybody else. And all the pressure is on you. Jesus wanted them to understand, it's not what you're looking at, it's what you have to do. And here's the thing, too many of us don't want to do what's necessary to follow God. To follow Jesus, you got to work on your serve. If you want to be great, you got to follow him and work on your serve. The foundation of the Christian life is a foundation of service. Jesus tells them, you're not like everybody else. Look at what he said. It's not so with you. In other words, you're not like that. When he's talking about, remember, he starts off by saying the Gentiles lord their power over others. He said, not so with you. Don't do that. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. In other words, going up means going down. Remember, Jesus shows over and over again that while he's the Messiah, he still serves. He's the son of God and he still serves. Remember, this is the same Jesus who was seated in heaven and came down to earth and wrapped himself in human form to die on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. He was sinless, died in our place. There's no greater service than that. He loved us enough to serve us when we should have been serving him. And too many of us, if we're honest, we want the plates up front. We want to sit on the dais, but we don't want to do the work. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be great, you've got to bend down, roll up your sleeves, and and serve to be great. To be great in this kingdom, to be great as a follower, you're never too important to serve. The more important you are, the more willing you have to be served. And here's the thing, serving is a sign of a transformed heart. 
when you begin to really serve and really serve others, not serve yourself, not serve to be noticed, but serving others even if nobody's ever going to know, that starts on the inside and works its way to the outside. None of us are too important to serve. None of us are too important to pitch in. None of us are too important to do something. And to be honest with you, here in the church, we're going to need some folk to serve pretty soon. As we start looking at reentry, we're going to need some folk to serve. We're going to need some folk to usher again. We're going to need some folk to greet again. We're going to need some folk to be hospitality. We're going to need some folk to serve again and never get too big to serve because when you serve, you're working on behalf of God. When you serve, you're serving God's people and God is looking, acknowledging and saying they've been working on their serve. I want you to know there's power in serving because serving is acknowledged, accepted and blessed by God. I'm proving to you that you can't be too big to serve. In, in, in the uh, 1800s, there's a guy by the name of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody's full name is Dwight Lyman Moody. Uh, he was an American evangelist and a publisher who founded the Moody Church, the Moody Bible Institute, and Moody Publishing House. He's one of the most famous evangelists of the late, 18, of the late 19th century. In 1800, he was known for his great Bible conferences. People would come from all over the world to go to the Moody Bible Conference. As a matter of fact, to this day, the Moody Publishing House still exists. There's nobody in this town. He's the Billy Graham of his day. He's Joel Osteen, Billy Graham, and T.D. Jakes all rolled into one with his own school. He's doing these huge Bible conferences where people come from all over the world internationally. And a thing happens at one of his conferences. A large group of European pastors came to one of his conferences in the late 1800s. This is as Moody's getting older. Mo you know, Moody's getting older. He's well known. He passes away in 1899. So in the late 1800s, he's been doing these conferences and people from Europe come. Following the European custom of the day, each of his guests who had come to the conference put his shoes outside the room to be cleaned by the hall servants overnight. But those European guests didn't realize this is America and we don't have hall service. Ain't nobody just rolling by to clean up your shoes. Moody is walking through the dormitory at night and he notices these shoes and is determined to not embarrass himself or the people working with him. He simply, he, all he had to do was mention the need to ministerial students who were there and he told them this is what's going on and, they, and he needed their help. They gave excuses and didn't want to serve. Moody didn't leave the boots. Instead, he returned to the dorm, gathered all the shoes and alone in his room, the world's most famous evangelist began to clean and polish the shoes. Only the unexpected of one other friend who was just coming by to say hi in the midst of the work revealed the secret. When the visitors from Europe opened their doors the next morning, their shoes were shined, they were all there, but they never knew by whom. Moody never told anyone, but his friend told a few people, and during the rest of the conference, different men volunteered to shine the shoes in secret, perhaps showing why God used D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody is the biggest guy in the world, and he says, I'm going to spend the night shining shoes. You know what it reminds me of? When Jesus is having the Last Supper, Jesus gathers his disciples together and begins to wash their feet. Now understand, washing feet is not exactly glamorous work. Because we're not talking about folk who had, you know, uh, Ferragamos and Gucci loafers. We're talking about people who were walking around in sandals in the dirt among dung and other refuse and disuse. And Jesus gets down and starts washing their feet. The lowest role in the house, the role of the servant. And some of the disciples, Peter in particular, says, don't do that. I will not let you wash my feet. Jesus says, if you don't wash my feet, you, if you don't let me wash your feet, you cannot have any part with me. Peter says, then fine. Wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head, wash whatever you need to wash. Because Jesus was telling him, if you can't humble yourself to serve, if you can't get off your high horse, then you're in the wrong place. I want you to know, my brothers, I want you to know, my sisters, serving comes through practice. You have to do it over and over again. You have to continually humble yourself and make a way for you to help others and serve others, even if you never get credit for it. Because that's what God would have us do. 
That's what Jesus would have us do. You do it over and over again. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you do it, the easier it comes to you. Like anything else, you've got to work on it. You've got to work on your serve. I want to end, you, end with this one little story. Many of you remember my friend, uh, Pastor Jason Clark, the senior pastor of the Omega Baptist Church of Baltimore, Maryland. Now, you know he's a great man of God. He's a great preacher. He's a songwriter. What many of you don't know is that he was also national champion in tennis while he was in college. One of the things that I love telling people is that I roomed with a national champion. And when he was national champion of tennis, I asked him, man, how do you do it? This is what Jason told me. Before practice, I hit 100 serves, and they all have to land in or I start over. After practice, I hit 100 more serves, and they all have to land in or I have to start over. So during practice, he's doing all the practicing he has to do. But beforehand, he works on his serve. And afterwards, he works on his serve. I said, man, why do you do it so much? He said, because by doing more than I have to, it becomes natural and it becomes doing what I need to. My brothers and my sisters, let's work on our service. Let's do more than we have to. Let's do more than what's required so that we can get better at serving and find the greatness of God. Remember what Jesus said. If you're going to be great, then you have to serve. Let's work on our serve. Hey, I hope that sermon enlivened your mind, opened your heart, and led you just a little bit closer to God. Listen, if the sermon had an effect on you, maybe that's God reaching out to you. Maybe that's God saying, it's time for you and I to connect. If you want more information about God, or if you want to be saved, or just to get more information about being saved, or if you want prayer or to become a part of the St. Paul family, we just want you to go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Contact Us button, and we'll get right back in contact with you for prayer, for salvation, or to be a part of the St. Paul family. Listen, let me ask you a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure that you know every time we put out a video so that you can be a part of the St. Paul family. And if you don't mind, copy the link and share it with some folk. If the word was great for you, the word will be great and a blessing to somebody else. If you enjoyed what we're doing, we'd love to have your support for the St. Paul Ministries. To support us, all you've got to do is go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Give button. It doesn't matter if you give a lot or if you give a little, but all of your support helps, all of your support counts, and all of your support helps us spread the word of God. Thanks for joining us. Remember, hit that subscribe button, and now it's time for the Williams Weekly Challenge. The word of God tells us to not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. One of the things that I've missed the most during the pandemic is air travel. I used to like flying to different places for conferences and vacation. I just loved being on planes. I still remember this time I was on a plane and there was this gentleman sitting next to me who helped everybody with their bag, putting them up in the overhead compartment. When he sat down, I said, man, that's really nice of you. He looked over me and said, I wasn't being nice, I'm a Christian. And Jesus said that the greatest among you will be your servants. So I just try to find places to serve. Listen, my challenge to you this week comes from my former plane friend. Find somewhere to serve. All of us have ability. All of us have some place that we can chip in. So this week, I challenge you, find a place to serve. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next time.